Success is easier than you think. It actually just boils down to one thing, which is avoiding bad decisions. Let's look at Oprah, who started a television show and became the host of it. The Rock, who started his career in entertainment and continued in different sectors of entertainment. Jeff Bezos, who started a store that sold books and turned into one of the biggest e-commerce stores essentially in the world. What do all these people have in common? They've all avoided making career ending dumb decisions. No matter how many good decisions you make, if you make one bad decision, it can wipe all the good ones out and I call this a net zero decision. I knew a guy in high school. He had everything going for him. Got a scholarship to an Ivy League college, had all the best friends, got a great internship, and then he came home for one summer between college. He decided to drink and he decided to drive, and that night he actually hit somebody, and because of that incident, he lost his scholarship, he lost his internship, he lost his job, and he lost most of his friends. His life was never the same after that. And that guy who might have gone on to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, he now continues to work at a bar in our hometown. He made one net zero decision that wiped out every good decision he'd made for 15 years leading up to that. We had a company that came to us and they wanted to work with us. We were doing our diligence on the company and I asked to speak with the operator because apparently this person was running the whole company and the founder was just kind of taking a back seat. So I met with the operator and I could immediately tell that this person was not it. They couldn't tell me their metrics, they were micromanaging people, and it was clear that they didn't have the best intentions with the founder. As soon as I talked to that person on the phone, I was like, one, I don't think we can invest in this company right now because I don't think we have the right leadership. And two, I need to tell them that this person's probably not right for the role. And so I met with the founder and I told him, and he said, Layla, I don't think that's the case. She's amazing. Well, he called me eight weeks later and that person not only had quit, but they took the whole team with them and essentially left the company at 50% less than it was doing in terms of revenue because they also stole the customers. Another example is that when we owned Gym Launch, that year we had made like 42 million in terms of revenue. Our EBITDA was fairly high, like 17 million EBITDA. We got to a point where our churn was higher than we wanted it to be. At that point in time, we didn't have a CFO, we didn't have a strong finance department. And I remember our team came to us and they kind of almost had like a little intervention at the time. They were like, listen, we're priced too high. We really need to cut the price. And in that moment, we just made a net zero decision because we decided to cut the price. And instead of decreasing our churn, we just decreased our EBITDA by $5 million a year. We didn't decrease churn at all, in fact. That's a net zero decision because that's very hard to get back. It took years for the company to recover from that. And it was definitely a decision that I wasn't happy that I made. So what most people try to do is they try to learn how to make good decisions. You don't need to learn how to make good decisions. We just need to learn how to avoid the terrible one. So in order to learn how to not make a terrible decision, we need to dissect why people make such terrible decisions. The first reason is called the paradox of choice. Given a situation where you have more options than less, you're more likely to make a bad decision or no decision at all. Customers given more choices are actually 10 times less likely to buy than customers that have less choices. For example, in a grocery store, there were 24 jars of jam for people to choose from. 3% of shoppers that came in for jam bought jam. In another grocery store, there were six choices of jam and 40% of the shoppers bought jam. The more options somebody has to choose from, the less likely they are to make a decision. I see this all the time when it comes to starting a business. People who don't start a business are not the ones who have limited options. If somebody has no way to make money but to start a business, they will find a business to start. If somebody has many things that they could choose from, they could freelance, they could start this business, they could take this job, then that person is more likely to not start a business because they're overwhelmed by the optionality they have. We had a portfolio company that came in and they actually on the sales call would present six different options to their customers to buy. And we said, oh shoot, we're gonna be able to increase the closing percentage, probably double it just by eliminating products. And we did. We actually doubled their closing percentage by taking from six products to two. The second reason that we make bad decisions is what I call the prison of perfectionism. We're afraid of taking action because we're afraid of an imperfect solution. And this tends to stem from the thinking that when we make a decision, it will create a solution that creates no other problems. But in reality, what we're always doing is we're always creating problems. And so the question actually comes down to, what problem would I prefer to deal with? The one that I currently have or the one that I will have by making this decision? So you see this a lot of the times in starting a business. People say, I wanna make so much money. So if I wanna make a ton of money, I'm gonna start a tech business. If you decide to, to create a tech business, you have to accept the problems you're gonna have, which is attracting engineering talent for a reasonable cost when you have no money. The fact that you know nothing about technology, you're gonna probably have to bring in a partner who you have to get a percentage of the business to so that they can help with the technology piece. And just pure ignorance, which is that you've never built a business before and you're picking a fairly hard business to start. If all of those sound like problems that you wish to have, sure, start a technology business. But if those sound like problems you don't wanna have, maybe consider a different business or something that's easier. The third reason that we make poor decisions is because we've never learned how. When I ask somebody, 
how do you make decisions? They can't even tell me. They don't have a process for making decisions. And so if you don't have a process for making decisions, you're probably just being led or dictated by your emotions. If we don't have a process, we're most likely going to just do what feels good in the moment, which often serves us in the short term and not in the long term. And the last reason that we make poor decisions is that we escalate practical problems into emotional problems. I'm not making enough money in my business. We allow that practical problem not making enough money to turn into a full-blown emotional disturbance. An example of this in someone's home life might be, my husband didn't get me what I wanted for my birthday. What does that then turn into? My husband doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't even think about me. He doesn't even know what I want for my birthday. The practical problem was the husband did not get me the gift I wanted. We interpret that into an emotional disturbance by what we make it mean. The same happens in business all the time. We had a portfolio company and they had some upset customers that left a poor review online. And they had an amazing business. Despite that, they said, we are a terrible company and we're not doing a good job. We need to redo our whole department. Wow, that really escalated quickly. And the reason for that is because of what they made the practical problem mean, which maybe it was just that, hey, this person left a bad review online. We should call them and figure out what happened because this could have been a one-off situation. Oftentimes we end up making poor decisions because we emotionally escalate ourselves when in reality, we can practically fix the problem without escalating it into an emotional disturbance. And the reality is, is that the higher our emotions, the lower our intellect. Studies have shown that the more emotional we are feeling, the higher velocity of an emotion in our body, the worst decisions we make. And this is why we need a process to protect us from making dumb decisions. The fewer dumb decisions we make, the higher quality of life we have. So how do we not make dumb decisions? Step one is we're going to identify the correct question to ask. If we ask the wrong question, then it leads to the wrong answer. How do I make more money? That question provides no direction. If we swap that for a question such as, how might I add enough value through my product or service that I can charge an additional $600 a month and can keep my customers happy? If we ask the right question, we immediately eliminate our overwhelm because it's clear. And what the right questions do is they eliminate endless options. The more vague the question that you're asking, the more likely you are to make a bad one because you have too many options to pick from. When you ask the right question, it will provide you with direction immediately when it's answered. The second step is that you wanna separate the problem from the symptoms. The way that I would find out what the actual problem is, is I would ask these questions. One, what are the possible reasons I'm noticing these symptoms? Two, what is happening? that if it stopped happening, would make the symptoms go away. Three, what is not happening that if it did happen, would make the symptom go away? So for a business owner, for example, it might be, I am not coming up with a strategy to grow my business. And if I was able to come up with a strategy, the symptoms would go away. What this leads me to think is the problem is that the business owner doesn't actually know strategy because they're inexperienced. If we brought in somebody who knew strategy and was talented and had done this before, then the symptoms would go away. So the solution is let's either hire somebody as a mentor consultant or hire somebody and bring them in through the organization who knows what they're doing. The third step is you wanna test your assumptions. Where are you substituting opinions for facts? I've tried everything and I just can't lose weight. Is that true? Yes, it's true, I've tried everything. Is it absolutely true? Would you stake your life on it? Well, no, I don't think I'd stake my life on it. Okay, well, that's not true. I've tapped out my market. We've absolutely saturated the market. Is that true? Yes, I can't get more customers. Okay, would you bet your life on it? Well, no. Why wouldn't you bet your life on it? Well, I guess we haven't tried anything besides Facebook and Instagram ads. I guess we haven't tried TikTok. We haven't tried LinkedIn. We've never done Outbound. But I guess I wouldn't stake my life on it. When we're substituting opinions for facts, we ask poor questions. The issue is that we're making assumptions that are not true, which lead us to ask false questions, which lead us to solutions that don't make any sense. Step four is the last step and probably the most practical one that you can put into use. You wanna map out your options for the decision and the most likely results. In one column, all of my options. Here's the three things that I could do to make a decision to solve this problem, wherever it may be. Now I'm going to ask myself for each one of those scenarios. So what is the upside? to each option. What is the downside to each option? Could I live with the worst case downside? Is that my preference? And then four is what is the likelihood of occurrence of that downside? When I was teaching my team about decision-making, some of the coworkers were having an issue with each other. And one of them came to me and they were like, I don't know how to handle this or what to do. Do I bring you in? Do I not bring you in? And so I gave her this matrix to make the decision. The three options that she had were one, confront my coworker myself, two, avoid my coworker indefinitely, three, tell my boss about my coworker to handle it. If she confronted her coworker, the upside is that she might resolve the issues and make her life easier. 
The downside is that the coworker might not take it well and it could actually escalate the situation. Could she live with her coworker escalating the situation? And now they have a worse relationship. And then what does she think the likelihood is the coworker would escalate it? She said it was about 40%. Second case scenario is she avoids the coworker. What's the upside? She doesn't have to be uncomfortable or risk rejection. The downside is that she's always going to have an underlying anxiety around them. It's gonna stop her from progressing and working with that person. Could she live with the worst case downside? which is not progressing in the company because she hasn't had a hard conversation and then feeling badly about herself for not upholding herself to the values of our company. And what does she think the likelihood of that downside happening is if she plays out that scenario? She said 95% because that's a feeling. And the last one was tell her boss about her coworker and have them talk to them. What's the upside? The boss will handle it for her. What's the downside? The coworker might actually lose respect because she went through the boss. What's the worst case downside? The coworker loses respect for her because she played monkey in the middle and put the boss in there. What's the likelihood the coworker will actually lose respect for her? She said 65%. So mapping all of that out, she said the best solution was to confront the coworker because she could live with the worst case downside because at least then she keeps her integrity, even if that person escalates the situation, which there's only a 40% chance they will. When you're mapping out these scenarios, how do you pick which one to choose? What you wanna pick is the solution that has the most probable compounding positive outcome. It's not just good today, it's good tomorrow, a month from now, and a year from now. If you have a solution and it's only good for today, but it's not good a year from now, then it's not the best solution.